Welcome to this course on microfluidics. From the title micro and uh, fluidics, uh, intuitively you may think that this is fluid mechanics that we know at micro scale or in micro channel. Well, uh, in some situation this may be true, but in many situations this may not be applicable. For example, if you consider flow between two parallel plates separated by 1 micron distance and uh, if you consider that the fluid is liquid, then we can go ahead and uh, apply the governing equations and the boundary conditions that we know from fluid mechanics to obtain the flow solution. But if the fluid between uh, the plates is gas, then use of uh, you know the equations and uh, the boundary conditions that we know are questionable. So, uh, you know in micro scale many flow situations we need to modify the boundary conditions or modify the governing equations and the entire approach could be different. Okay. So, uh, what happens at micro scale is there is a modification of different forces that are involved. For example, surface forces uh, like surface tension become very dominant and this is because of the high surface to volume ratio at micro channel. And uh, the volume forces or the body forces like uh, the weight of the fluid becomes almost negligible. Okay. And uh, the modification of these forces bring in interesting and unique effects that are only realizable in micro scale flows. To give you another example of how micro scale flow is different from that of micro, micro scale. If you consider let us say mixing of two fluids at micro scale we know that if you increase the Reynolds number of the flow you know the two fluids will talk to each other better and uh, the mixing will be more effective. At micro scale in small channels exactly the reverse happens because in micro channels the mixing is diffusion based and here if you increase the Reynolds number the diffusion time scale goes down. So, the mixing becomes less effective as we increase the Reynolds number. Similarly, there are some special effects like uh, electrosmosis, electrophoresis, dielectrophoresis and these effects are only realizable at micro scale. At micro scale such effects are almost negligible. You know these new and unique effects and combined with uh, the modification of different forces that are involved bring in you know unique characteristic to micro scale flows and that can be exploited to design and develop microfluidic devices for different applications for healthcare diagnostics for chemical and biological application for drug delivery and drug discovery and many more different applications are possible. In this particular course our focus would be to understand the fundamentals and the principles of fluid flows at micro scale. We would also look at how we can design different uh, you know microfluidic components how we can analyze them, but we will restrict our discussion to the component level microfluidics. Towards the end we will talk about few applications of microfluidics where we would bring in different microfluidic components to build microfluidic systems. So, with that uh, let us look at the course outline. So, we would first uh, start by talking about the origin of the microfluidics, how microfluidics evolve. We will define what microfluidics is, we will talk about some of the benefits and uh, challenges in microfluidics and look at the some of the commercial activities that are going on in microfluidics. Then we will look at the physics of miniaturization as we reduce the length scale how the physics uh, is going to be modified and we will discuss that in the context of scaling laws. In the next chapter uh, we would talk about fluid mechanics in micro scale or in micro channels. Here we would be talking about uh, you know the intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules and uh, how that can 
help us understand the different states of matter solid, liquid and gas. We will talk about uh, the continuum theory and then discuss the governing equations and constitutive relations for gas and liquid flows. We will discuss uh, you know the boundary conditions uh, if for both for liquid and gases and here we discuss the slip theory. Then we will go over the transition to turbulence how flow can transit from laminar to turbulent and uh, we will also discuss the low Reynolds number flows and entrance effects. Then we would discuss some of the basic flows uh, and we will try to obtain the solutions and we will take a very simple case fluids in mechanical equilibrium then we talk about liquid film flow in an inclined plane and then we will go over coit flow, Poiseuille flow and then discuss Stokes drag on a sphere. We would also briefly cover the time dependent flows and two, two phase flows. And uh, then we would consider quiet flow with slip at the walls. Then we would uh, talk about uh, hydraulic resistance and we use, use that to analyze fluidic circuits and uh, we will discuss that uh, in the context of straight channels of different cross sections and uh, we will talk about channels in syringe and parallel. In the following uh, chapter, we will talk about capillary flows, flows in small channels or capillaries where we would talk about uh, surface tension and interfacial energy. We will discuss uh, the young Laplace equation which basically drives capillary flows and uh, introduce contact angles, capillary length, capillary rise, interfacial boundary conditions and Marangoni effect. In the following chapter, we will discuss uh, electrokinetics. Here we would start by talking about the fundamentals of electrohydrodynamics and then go over electrosmosis, electrophoresis, dielectrophoresis and electrocapillary effects. So, we will talk about all of these electrokinetic effects. Uh, then we would move on to talk about microfabrication techniques. Here. Uh, we would talk about both uh, you know silicon based as well as polymer microfluidic device fabrication. We will start with talking about materials uh, clean room where these microfluidic devices are fabricated and then discuss briefly about the silicon crystallography and uh, Miller indices. In silicon uh, you know microfluidic device fabrication we will talk about oxidation, photolithography, etching micro machining, bulk and surface micro machining and bonding of wafers. So, this is what we will talk about to fabricate silicon microfluidic devices. Then we would talk about polymer microfluidic device fabrication where we would talk about different substrates the PMMA, COC and PDMS substrates and different uh, established fabrication procedures like uh, micro molding and hot embossing would be discussed. And uh, then we will briefly talk about fluidic interconnections. In the following chapter, we will talk about uh, microfluidic components, different microfluidic components like micro pumps, micro valves, micro flow sensors, and micro mixtures. Micro pumps are components that is used to drive fluid through microfluidic devices. Micro valves are used to manipulate flow in micro devices. Micro flow sensors are used to measure flow rate in microfluidic devices and micro mixers are used to mix fluids in micro devices. Then we would talk about uh, droplet generators, discrete droplets in micro channels has formed uh, a different uh, area of microfluidics called uh, digital microfluidics. And then we would also talk about micro particle separators and micro reactors. And the last chapter would be on the applications of microfluidics where we would talk about uh, you know its applications on diagnostics and biosensing. So, that is regarding the course outline or the syllabus. These are uh, different uh, 
text and reference books that uh, you know for this course uh, it is relevant. And uh, my lecture would comprise uh, materials from these books as and when it is appropriate from different books. All these books are uh, equally important. The first book is on fundamentals and applications of microfluidics by N. T. Gwen. And the second book is by Henrik Bruch, uh, Theoretical Microfluidics by Henrik Bruch. The third book is on fabrication, fundamentals of microfabrication by Madhu. And the next book is on introduction to microfluidics by Patrick Tebling. The next book is micro and nanoscale fluid mechanics by Brian Kirby. And uh, finally, we have microfluidics by Stephen Collin. So, all these books, uh, most of these books have Indian edition, so you can actually buy them. Okay, with that, let us uh, get introduced to what microfluidics is. Microfluidics originated from a larger area called MEMS or microelectromechanical systems. I, here, if you look at uh, the evolution of technology in the previous century, the first half of the previous century belonged to vacuum tube technology, where we talked about uh, radio, radar and television. And uh, the second half uh, belonged to semiconductor technology, where we started with uh, transistors coming in, uh, which was invented in the Bell Labs in 1947. And then came computers and there was cell phone revolution. We all have seen what has taken place in the second half of the previous century. In the next 50 years or so, the nanotechnology era is going to come and where some of these applications we have already started to see, uh, you know internet appliances, wearable and wireless, molecular ele electronics and nanorobots. MEMS is considered as the path and link between semiconductor technology and nanotechnology. The area of MEMS uh, got recognized in 1957, 59, where you know Richard Feynman said there is plenty of room at the bottom. What he indicated was a lot could be done by looking at the lower end of the dimensional spectrum, namely the nanoscale and microscale. So, the area got uh, recognized and a lot of uh, efforts were put to develop uh, MEMS devices. The first uh, MEMS device uh, was fabricated uh, by Westinghouse in 1968 and then uh, you know many more new MEMS devices was uh, were coming up. As I said uh, the semiconductor technology was considered as the most uh, enabling technology of the last century. And uh, MEMS got developed in parallel with the semiconductor technology. So, the area of MEMS uh, as it is called uh, in the US and uh, in Europe it is called uh, microsystems technology. In Japan it is uh, known as uh, micro machines and uh, in India the area got rec recognized about uh, 6, 7 years ago and uh, it is called micro and smart systems. So now, let us talk about how microfluidics uh, originated. If you look at uh, here, uh, the origin of uh, microfluidics can be traced uh, sometime in 1960s around here, where the inkjet uh, printing technology was uh, developed. And around 1980s, uh, the first gas chromatography uh, device uh, came off which can be used for uh, you know chemistry chemical applications and the real thrust to microfluidics came uh, around 1990s uh, after the fifth international conference on transducer 1989 where Manj et al told that life science and chemistry are two important applications of microfluidics there are a lot of uh, you know tremendous amount of uh, effort were put to develop microfluidic devices. So, around 1990s, uh, you know IC technology was used to develop microfluidic devices. And uh, then in the year uh, 2000, soft lithography was invented 
by uh, different research groups including white sites group at Harvard University. And uh, followed by invention of subtle soft lithography, there was an explosion in the field. A lot of uh, you know work was done to develop microfluidic devices using soft lithography for various different applications. When you talk about microfluidics, there were different uh, competing terms. Uh, for example, since it came from MEMS and the fluidic part of uh, MEMS. Uh, uh, it was named as MEMS fluidics and then there was a uh, term bio MEMS which is basically the area of MEMS applied to bio applications, but the uh, you know title microfluidics prevailed okay, and it is widely accepted. Now if we you know how we can define microfluidics. Okay. So, microfluidics can be defined as the science and engineering of devices or systems in which the fluid behavior may differ, differ from that of in the micro, micro scale flow theory due to small length scales of the systems. Okay. Now, when we talk about uh, microfluidics, there are three different uh, important questions that appear. The first question is what micro refers to in microfluidics, okay. how small is micro in microfluidics. Is it referring to the device size or it is referring to the, the actual fluid quantity. The second important question is microscopic fluid quantity, how small the volume of the fluid can be in microfluidics. So the third question is why micro scale, okay, why we need to go to micro scale. So in this lecture we try to answer the first two questions. Whereas the third question is a much bigger question and a major part of this course would be trying to understand uh, the third question. Okay. So here we try to uh, understand what micro refers to in microfluidics. If you look at here uh, in this uh, you know here. Uh, we have length scales and volume scales. We have length scales from 1 angstrom to 1 meter in an interval of uh, 2 orders of magnitude and uh, we have volume scales from 1 actuliter to 1000 liter in an interval of 3 orders of magnitude. If you talk about devices that have sizes uh, you know greater than 10 millimeter and uh, our volume which is larger than 1 milliliter, it is categorized as conventional fluidic devices. Our human hair is uh, of the order of uh, 100 micron in size and the typical volume is 1 nanoliter. Biological objects like viruses and uh, bacteria, viruses have volume less than 1 hectoliter and uh, bacteria have size between 100 nanometer you uh, about 10 micron depending on which dimension we are talking about and they have volume between 1 actoliter to 1 picoliter. Devices that have size less than 1 micron okay, they are uh, known as nano devices. Microfluidic devices have size uh, between you know 100 micron to about 100 millimeter. Okay. So that is the size of the microfluidic device either it can be the channel size or it could be the overall footprint of the device and they have volume between 1 picoliter to 1 liter. So this is uh, you know we understand now what we uh, refer to micro in microfluidic devices. So in microfluidics the length of uh, the channel is not important the length of the channel could be as long as few meters, but the actual fluidic space is going to be important in microfluidics. Okay. So this is very important to understand. If we talk about uh, electrical uh, MEMS, structural MEMS for example uh, a cantilever sensor, if we reduce the size of the cantilever we can expect that the sensitivity may go up. Okay. But in microfluidics we are not after increasing the sensitivity 
uh, increasing reducing the size of the device we are after miniaturizing the fluidic space. So it is actually the miniaturization of the fluidic space which brings in new effect and uh, these new effects are exploited to design develop new devices. So in microfluidics the device size is not important but the microscopic fluid quantity is going to be the key. In microfluidics also the device material or the fabrication method they are not going to be important. So here we try to look at how small a fluid quantity could be in microfluidics. So the fluid quantity volume okay, the volume of the fluid that we use in microfluidics would depend on the concentration of the analyte that we want to detect for example in life science application. So here you would see the typical volume of uh, typical concentration of different analytes in a milliliter of blood. So you can see the concentration of sodium glucose uh, you know the analyte that we need for fingerprinting and many other analytes. And uh, you can see that the volume of the sample that you need uh, to detect certain analyte is inversely proportional to the concentration of the analyte. For example here since the concentration of the glucose is in, in the blood sample is very high the amount of volume that we need to detect glucose will be less as compared to if we are to detect DNA fingerprinting. So this is what is shown here in this plot here uh, on the x axis you have the sample volume and in the y axis you have the analyte concentration. Now any point which is below this line has less than 1 molecule per sample. So the detection is not possible. Any point which is above this line uh, you know in that case perfect detection is possible with statistical confidence. Okay. So that you have enough number of molecules to do the detection. If you compare DNA assay with clinical chemistry in case of DNA assay the concentration here is very low as compared to let us say you want to detect glucose. Okay. So since the concentration in this case is low you need a larger volume of sample to do the detection whereas here since the concentration is very high you need low volume of sample for the detection. Right now we talk about uh, some of the benefits of microfluidics. The first uh, benefit of microfluidics is the scaling laws. The scaling laws bring in new effects, okay, new and unique effects that are only realizable at micro scale and which provide better performance. The second uh, benefit is in terms of reduction of material. Since we are talking about uh, you know device of smaller size there is saving in terms of material and since we are talking about you know different functionalities coming together in a smaller space we are talking about smaller power budget. Okay. Also it leads to faster devices okay, because all the functionalities are done over a small space it uh, the performance or the speed of the device goes up. The third set of uh, benefits is miniaturization, integration and automation. Since we are talking about using microfabrication to make microfluidic devices miniaturization is very well possible and integration is possible in microfluidics. We can integrate fluidics with optics and electronics. Automation is possible. We can automate a you know the way we want to perform different functionalities in a microfluidic device using a software using a software interface like LabVIEW. Next we will look at uh, some of the challenges that exist in microfluidics. The first uh, challenge is the is manufacturing in terms of manufacturing after uh, about you know three decades of developments in microfluidics we are yet to see a manufacturing method that is reliable, cheap and repeatable. Okay. The second uh, challenge that exists in microfluidics is interface and ease of use. Okay. In microfluidics we talk about uh, lab on chip concept okay. 
where uh, you know we try to bring in uh, different uh, operations that we do in a typical lab. For example, in a pathological lab we want to analyze blood and we have you know various equipment present in the lab. We want to bring in all the equipment, uh, the functionalities that uh, can be achieved using the equipment into a small chip and that would be called as lab on chip, okay? the lab on chip concept. But till now the chip is very small, but it is the peripheral equipment like you need a pump to drive fluid through the chip and you need a detection system that make the chip uh, very bulky. Okay. So, until now what we have seen is chip in a lab rather than lab on a chip which we would like to achieve. The third and uh, important uh, application uh, uh, the challenges is going to be finding the right kind of application. So, we are yet to find a killer application that will create a strong business case for a product which will give a thrust to the area of microfluidics. Next, uh, we talk about some of the commercial activities uh, in microfluidics. Uh, it is happening in different sectors in point of care diagnostics, in drug discovery, in biosensors and also in terms of providing services. In point of care diagnostics, we have uh, companies like Philips, Clarus, Fluidime, uh, Abbott, Rendance and we have a company called Achira Labs in Bangalore which is also trying to develop uh, point of care diagnostics. In drug discovery, we have uh, you know companies like uh, Emerald and uh, Pfizer, where they are trying to use microfluidic uh, technologies to uh, you know uh, do drug screening, multiple drug screening. Then uh, microfluidics uh, can be applied uh, to uh, biosensor applications, uh, and companies like Innovative Biosensors are working on developing biosensors based on microfluidics. And then uh, there are some commercial activities going on uh, in terms of uh, providing services. Okay, let's say you, are, you want to uh, fabricate microfluidic devices uh, you, from a vendor. There are uh, vendors like uh, Micronet, Chipsop, and uh, Dolomite who can actually design and fabricate the chips for you. So let's talk about uh, scaling laws. Before we talk about scaling laws. Let us try to understand what we mean by scaling down. Scaling down means uh, we want to reduce the size of a device or size of a system isomorphically equally from all directions. So, scaling down means system reduced in size isomorphically. If you consider uh, you know surface area of a device, surface area scales as L square and uh, volume scales as L cube. Okay. So, this is the surface area we can say A and the volume is V. So, the surface area to volume ratio would scale as 1 over L. Now, at micro scale, micro scale L is small and that gives the area to volume ratio goes up. So, at micro scale the surface uh, area to volume ratio is very high. So, the surface effects become dominant, okay. but how we can see you know the effects of high surface area to volume ratio, we have to consider few examples. Before we you know consider a few microsystems, let us discuss this in the context of some of the ob objects that exist in nature. Okay. So, uh, for example, the first example that we would see is you know how small or how big animals could be. So, we try to see how small or big animals could be. Okay. 
Now, the this we can uh, find out by considering energy balance. Okay, so if we can find out how much heat is being generated by an animal and compare that with how much heat is being rejected. Now, the heat uh, generated is proportional to the body weight. Okay, so it's proportional to weight. So that means it's proportional to LQ, and uh, the heat rejected. We can say that he is being conducted from inside the body to the surface. So that is by conduction, and uh, by conduction heat transfer we can write K A delta T over L. So this scales as L. Heat rejected would scale as L. So this is let's say you know heat generated Q G, and this is Q rejected Q R. Here we see that. Qz by Qr is going to scale as L square, right? Or Q rejected over Qz would scale as one over L square. So uh, you know, as L reduces, Qr is going to increase. So you know smaller animals will lose heat constantly and their heat rejection is much more significant as compared to the heat generated within the body. So they need to eat continuously to generate enough amount of heat to survive and this is in fact the case uh, in case of uh, Pismistru. Okay. Pismistru is the smallest uh, warm blooded animal that is found and it needs to eat constantly to maintain its body temperature. Okay. Whereas the other extreme blue whale is the largest animal that is possible. Okay. So here if you see as L increases then heat rejection will go down. So for larger animals heat rejection become an issue. For example, that and that is the reason why there is a limit on the maximum size of the animal. Okay, blue whale is the largest animal possible, and uh, in them uh, heat rejection is a major issue, and that is the reason when a hunter actually kills a whale, because uh, you know in typically the heat from the inside of the whale uh, gets. Are transported to the surface because of the blood circulation and when a well is killed the circulation blood circulation stops. So the heat is actually trapped inside their body. So as soon as the well is killed its meat gets cooked. So there is a maximum size on the uh, you know animal which is blue well and there is a minimum size of the animal which is the now let us look at uh, another example where we say that you know why it is possible to you know for uh, an animal which is very small in size to walk on water. Why insects can walk on water where, while you know human cannot walk on water. So why walking possible? below certain size okay now here we can say that the gravitational force the gravitational force which acts downward direction is proportional to l cube and uh, the surface tension force which tries to balance the gravitational force surface tension is scales as L. So uh, this is let us say F G and uh, surface tension force is F S. So F S 
to f g scales as 1 over L square. Okay. So, as in, in micro scale, in micro scale L is small. So, the surface tension to the weight of the body is very high. So, there is a high probability that uh, you know smaller creatures can walk on water and that is the reason why insects can easily walk on water because the surface tension force is much higher compared to the body force, the gravitational force while we cannot walk on water. And this also explain uh, why we are you know it is easy to spill coffee from a cup, but it is not possible to pour water from a capillary. Okay. So, with that uh, you know we continue our discussion on uh, vertical uh, tremor equation, okay. tremors vertical uh, notation. So, we look at tremors vertical bracket notation. So, using tremors vertical bracket notation, if you know how uh, you know different forces scale with length scales, it is possible to find out how acceleration time and power to volume ratio would scale. Okay. So, if we can generalize, let us write some force F scaling as L 1, L 2, L 3 up to L to the power n. Okay. So, we can generalize it as F to the power n. Then we can say that acceleration A is F over m. So, L to the power n into m is L to the power q. So, L to the power minus 3. Similarly, we can find time is 2 x m over f square root. So, that is scaling as L to the power 1 into L to the power cube divided by F L to the power n. So, square root. So, this is scaling. So, that would scale as L to the power 4 minus n square root. Okay. Similarly, the power to volume ratio, power to volume ratio, you know power is work divided by time. So, f x over t into 1 over v. So, that will be L to the power n. So, this will scale as L to the power n, x is L and t is L to the power 4 minus n square root into 1 over L q. Okay. So, that would scale as L to the power n minus 2 divided by L to the power 4 minus n square. So, we can uh, you know generalize f if f is L 1, L 2, L 3, L to the power n then implies acceleration can be generalized as acceleration L to the power minus 2, L to the power minus 2, then L to the power minus 1, L to the power 0, L to the power n minus 3. And uh, time t could be generalized as L to the power L to the power 1.5, L to the power 1, L to the power 0.5, uh, 
up to L to the power 4 minus n square root. Similarly, the power to volume ratio can be generalized as L to the power 2 point minus 2.5, L to the power minus 1, L to the power 0.5 up to L to the power n minus 2, L to the power n minus 2 divided by square root of L to the power 4 minus n. So, you can see here, you know for force if you look at different elements, let us say the first element. So, L to the power 1, so n is 1, then the acceleration by this formula is going to be L to the power n minus 3. So, this is going to be minus 2. Okay. Acceleration will scale as L to the power minus 2 and uh, you know the time is going to scale as uh, L to the power 4 minus n square root. So, that would be 1.5. Okay. So, this would scale as time would scale as L to the power 1.5. Similarly, for power to volume ratio, we have this formula here. Okay. If n equal to 1, we would get the power to volume ratio to be L to the power minus 2.5. So, uh, you know from uh, the Trimmer's vertical uh, notation, we observe uh, two interesting things. One is, so we have two important observations. One is when n equal to 4, okay, which is the case for centrifugal force, centrifugal force or magnetic force, then the time, time would scale as L to the power 4 minus n square root. So, this would scale as L to the power 0. So, for centrifugal force and magnetic force, the, uh, the time is independent of the length scale okay. and this is contradictory to our normal observations or intuition that smaller things tend to be faster. The other important observation is the maximum scaling exponent for force is possible for uh, you know for not for force but for moment mass moment of inertia mass moment of inertia which would scale as l to the power phi so the maximum scaling is possible for mass moment of inertia which would scale as l to the power phi so uh, in that case uh, you know what it means is as L reduces, then the mass moment of inertia goes down significantly. So, what that uh, means is that smaller motors could achieve the maximum speed much faster as compared to larger motors. Okay. So, that is the conclusion we can make. So, with that uh, let us stop here.